Um, so what, back to part of this is, so I gave you kind of the statistics, sure. right? Faith culture is, is huge for us. Um, you know, you know, so we've, we've done stuff with, with Joel Olstein, we've done stuff with, um, you know, other faith leaders and stuff. And, and one of my things was, you know, you're my pastor. Yeah. And, uh, I don't think a lot of people know who you are. Sure. And I don't say that as a, as a backhanded, no. as a, in a backhanded way. So, um, you know, when I, when I started coming, it's like, there's this, there's this incredible story. There's all this kind of stuff. I, I, you know, let's, let's, let's let people hear that. Yeah. Right. So you've, you've talked, you've talked from the pulpit. I know you've, you told the story probably a lot, but you survived brain cancer. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, take me back to that moment, right? You, you actually mentioned it yeah. if, when the seizure happened. Yeah. What happened? What was, what was, what do you remember? Yeah. Vividly? Well, you know, most of what I remember about the actual seizure itself and that whole day is told to me as I don't have right. a, a lot of memory. So what I do remember is that the plan was for the day um, to go to my in-laws house. So they live a mile from us. And so when I got up, Lauren, you know, graciously just said, hey, rest tomorrow, you've been running hard, so just sleep in. And so I got up and poured myself a, a cup of coffee and um, Lauren was preparing some dishes that we were gonna take to my in-laws. And um, as I was walking to sit down, she asked me if I'd feed Nora. And uh, do you remember that? Or I do remember that. that. Okay. No, I, I'll tell you when I no longer remember. Yeah. So uh, she asked me to feed Nora her bottle. So I prepared the bottle and grabbed Nora, who was six months old at the time. And my other two children were in the living room watching morning cartoons and uh, kind of flipping between cartoons and the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, right? And, um, uh, or whatever parade is there on, on Thanksgiving morning. And uh, we, uh, <laughs> we, I feed Nora and burp her, and then I take her to put her in her Johnny Jump Up, right? The little thing that hooks in the door frames. And, uh, a little death trap, if you ask me, but put her in that. And then I, I was walking back to sit in my chair. Um, a cup of coffee was over there, I was just walking back to sit down and literally I woke up in the hospital. Um, I, didn't, I didn't feel anything coming on. I didn't literally have no memory of thinking, oh, that's weird, my hand's asleep or anything. I mean, I just woke up in the hospital. And so um, when I came to, uh, Lauren, Lauren explained that, um, I had had a grand mal seizure uh, that I had literally, she heard, what she heard, because she was in the kitchen, was that the fireplace tools fell over and rattled. And so she kept waiting to hear me either get onto one of the children or tell the kids that it was okay. And she, she didn't hear anything. And, and my oldest, Audrey, um, you know, called for, hey, mom. And so when Lauren came in, she said, I turned the corner and I was on the floor seizing. And so she turned me on the side, called 911. Um, and then I, I apparently started coming back into my senses after the paramedics got there and had put me on the gurney. Um, they were trying to strap me in the gurney. Apparently, I didn't care for that, so I punched one of them at, at which, which I don't know what that says about what's going on <laughs> in me subconsciously, but um, they, they popped me with something to knock me out, and that's what uh -huh. kind of wiped the memory. Um, so I wake up in the hospital, Lauren kind of walks me through what just happened and then doctor came in. I, I don't remember the CT scan or the MRI. They had already done both of those before I kind of came to and the emergency room doctor kind of sc scooted his stool right up next to my uh, bed and just said, hey, we found a, a mass in your right frontal lobe. Um, and, and he said, you're going to need to go see a neurosurgeon. He was really compassionate, really gracious, and, and just said, hey, this is about the size of a golf ball. It looks encapsulated. You're going to need to go see a neurosurgeon. Now, at, here, this might sound hard to believe. It, like in that moment, I really was just like, okay, just get me out of it. I just want to leave. It's Thanksgiving. I bit through my tongue. I'm miserable. All these people are at my in-laws, um, you know, not knowing whether or not to celebrate Thanksgiving or not. I mean, it was just kind of real weird. What do you do? Um, and so, so yeah, they finally released us and we went, I couldn't eat, I'd bit through my tongue, so I couldn't really eat anything that night. I just kind of drank some stuff and, um, hung out and then that started the process. Went and saw a neurosurgeon on Tuesday. So that happened on a Thursday. On Tuesday, went and saw the neurosurgeon and we completely thought, um, that he was going to say, ah, you know what, it, we'll, we'll just put you on some meds to control the seizures and we'll watch this. And we had honestly been told by a very well-meaning um, member of the church who read scans. He looked at the scan and said, ah, it looks like an encapsulated low-grade glioma. You'll be fine. Mm. They're probably going to give you some meds to manage your 
seizures, but then they'll just keep an eye on it. Um, so, I mean, I went in thinking that's exactly what I was going to hear. And Barnett flipped on the screen. And as soon as he flipped on the screen, you could see that his screen was not like the screen that the guy pulled up that looked at the scan that the emergency room had given me. His was all bright colored. And, and he said, well, Matt, I'm, I'm just going to want to be honest with you. This looks really bad. I've created some space for you on Friday. We're going to need to go in and cut this out. And so, I mean, that was the first time really the floor dropped out. I, I didn't, in the emergency room, Matt, right, you know, you got a mass in your right frontal lobe. I don't know that I ever went, oh, no. Or, I mean, the, the first thought I had uh, upon hearing that I had the mass was, okay, it's me. I can do me. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily want to do my wife or any of my children. But if, if somebody's got to get roughed up here, then mm -hmm. uh, I let it be me mm -hmm. and not one of them. And, but no floor drop out, no, oh, my gosh. But you know, to, to sit down with a neurosurgeon and have him go through the long line, of, you know, the long list of things that can happen when they cut out most of your right frontal lobe is, uh, is that, that was when I was like, oh my gosh, and Friday. I mean, this is Tuesday and they're saying Friday. Right. So I've got, I, I may not ever preach again. I'm, how am I supposed to tell the church that I'm going through this? How do, who do you, con I mean, who do you communicate with first? How do you um, prepare for this? Um, not theologically or spiritually, I think we had, we had set that here at the village long before I got sick with just kind of my frustration with prosperity gospel nonsense and um, the just blatant openness of suffering in the scriptures right. and how God uses that and doesn't cause it, but uses it for good and glory. Job. There is Job or the fact that, I mean, we could go, that'd be a whole nother yeah, subject. Right. <laughs> but um, so, so ultimately that was when the kind of floor dropped out and, and, and then like right about that time, we ran out of tears. We found the floor again and all that we said we believed and all the confidence that we had and God's purposes and plans and goodness all rushed back in, flooded back in and we got ready for surgery. I shot a video for the church to show to the church because I wouldn't, you know, have surgery on Friday. I wouldn't be able to make it that weekend and go, here's what's coming this next week. Um, so we shot a video and rolled that video out. And that was kind of the video that kind of went viral and, mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of increased uh, my influence in the years to come. So what was, um, did, you, did, did you have any struggles with God? I mean, was there any of that um, wrestling? So the, I had a moment and, and the moment was, I've, I've said this before, um, so I guess it's a matter of public record now that the internet exists, but the, I remember sitting on my couch um, and this is now at this point, this is after surgery. I know I've got malignant brain cancer. I know they've only given me two to three years to live. I know all of this. I'm in radiation, on low dose chemo, moving towards high dose chemo. And I was sitting on my couch and this was a weird, the hardest thing in the world for me was to be around my kids. Um, like it was just like I wanted to withdraw. I, I mean, I wanted to just put in headphones and listen to music and, and pull back. Cause just there was so much loss I was feeling. And, um, and so I'm sitting on the couch one day and, um, you know, this is all Christmas time. And, and so my wife had taken these Christmas cards with everybody's pictures on them. I don't know when that started, but everybody, you know, sends, you know, right. pictures of their family and their right. dog or, and there was a, there was a picture of a family, um, that we're friends with, or my wife's friends with the wife. And the, the guy has had multiple affairs on his wife and is just, just unbelievably self-centered and wicked to his wife and um, rude to his daughters and it just uh, and I remember looking at that picture and going really me like I'm the one with brain cancer are you serious well, I'm the one with and I felt in that very quickly the Lord was gracious because I very quickly remembered uh, Luke 15 and the older brother saying I never you know I never even, you never even gave me a goat I didn't bring prostitutes into your land I didn't and 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 I felt wicked in the moment right. and, you know, said, you're right, Lord, forgive me and strengthen me. And there's a passage in Nehemiah where Nehemiah is um, trying to rebuild the wall, the breached wall of Jerusalem. And um, while he's trying to do that, there are all these other issues that are going on. And he prayed, now, Lord, strengthen my hands. And, and that kind of became a, a verse for me that I just kind of put in my gut and asked the Holy Spirit to just let me marinate in that text and, and let my hands be strong here. I, I want to praise you and make much of you in this journey. You've been so, you've dealt so generously with me that it, how could I praise you when everything's awesome and then not when things don't look like they're going my way. Mm -hmm. 
And so that, that was kind of the moment. And other than that moment, I don't know that I had a, another one. That was kind of early on the, the kind of divine spanking, I guess, I got. You know, the get right, in the corner right. and think about that moment where the Lord kind of disciplined my heart to think rightly about this part of the journey. What was the hardest part through that journey? You know, the, the loss that, that I felt my, most was, um, you know, my own background, the Lord saved me out of some real dysfunction uh, in my family growing up. And so I had really wanted and, and still very much have this desire to um, walk my daughters down the aisle, to watch my son, to, to kind of break some historic sins that have been in the Chandler bloodline for 200 years. And um, the thought of the thought of my children growing bitter towards the Lord, because you don't die pretty of primary brain cancer. I mean, you lose your mind, you lose your functions. You, it's a really ugly way to die. And so the thought that my children might grow embittered towards the Lord um, was, I mean, it was almost more than I could bear. And, um, and so that was by far the most difficult. It wasn't it wasn't, oh, not growing old with Lauren, even though I desperately want to grow old with Lauren. I mean, we've been right. through, through so much and just I'm not who I am without her. God's used her um, as the most effective tool in both my own sanctification and my own joy uh, than anything else. Um, but, but to think that my children, I would die, go to glory. My wife has the, a sound, solid faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wouldn't be worried about her wavering or falling apart. She's just way too strong for that. Um, but my, at the time, you know, my kids were six months old, three years old, six years old. So the, the thought that they wouldn't be able to grasp and understand and would grow up bitter and angry towards the Lord, because we deal with that a lot here. Um, that, I mean, that was, that to me was like almost unbearable. And what was it that got you through that, those scriptures you talked about? Yeah, I mean, I just think leaning in the Lord and trusting, you know, the one thing that we have regardless of our circumstances that should always compel the Christian to consider the love of God is the cross, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, ever before me is this reality that God is for me, not against me, as seen in the sending of His Son, the initiating love of God and sending Christ into the world to die for sinners is that thing that should transcend any and all of my circumstances and show me that my sickness wasn't punitive. God wasn't going, you didn't have, you know, you, read, you didn't read your Bible enough, so I'm going to give you this to teach you a lesson. That's not what happened. Um, and, and so really just my confidence in the fact that the Lord saved me, rescued me. If there are anyone that shouldn't be a Christian, I'm one of them. Um, I mean, I grew up with all the abuses of religion and none of the real benefits of it. And um, I mean, if anyone has a story in which they could go, uh, you know, I, I'll tell you why not to believe in Jesus. And, and yet the Lord wasn't having it. I'm, I mean, he just kind of saved me out of what David called the muck and the mire. Talk, talk about that a little bit. I mean, what, 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 is, that, what is that history? We, why, you yeah, know, I, why? I mean, the, the, I had two things present in my home growing up. My mother um, was, she was everything you would kind of consider in, in that kind of classical religious, you know, kind of rules based. Um, here's what we don't do. You know, we don't do this, we don't do this, we don't do this, we do this, we do this, we do this. Regardless of the fact that those things are never accurate. Um, what you do when you create that list is you send people underground with their struggles. Um, and, and then my father was uh, abusive and angry and violent when he wasn't absent. And, and so here I've, I've got what happens when you give yourself over to licentiousness. And then I've got what happens if you give yourself over to a type of rules-based religion that has nothing to do with an active relationship with Jesus Christ and arresting in His grace and has everything to do with God help her trying to earn what God had freely given her in Christ. And so here I've got this woman who puts um, these inconsistent rules on all of us that are almost, you know, kind of harsh. Um, but then this father who's abusive and drunken and, um, and like I could never just go, okay, well, if your Jesus is so awesome, then why are we here? Why are we in this? And why won't you get us out of this? And so for me, Jesus was kind of this enabling, weak, you know, thing that made us stay in this really terrible situation because mom just wasn't leaving. I mean, it's just because she's duty bound. Right. And, um, and would even defend, you know, I mean, like a classic codependent would even defend his behavior. You know, when I would press, it's like, mom, get us out of here. She's like, if it wasn't for your day, you wouldn't be here. So, I mean, I learned to really get frustrated by this idea of my mom's Jesus. Uh, but at the same time, I didn't want to go the route that I saw my dad go um, in, in regards to how he was living his life. So 
So, I mean, I had these reasons to just go, okay, I think there probably is a God out there. Certainly don't want my mom's. Right. And how did you eventually come? Well, I mean, funny enough, we, my dad was a military man. And so we got transferred to Texas. And when I got into high school, I was playing football. And this is just the craziest story. A, a guy that I played high school football with said, hey, I need to tell you about Jesus. When do you want to do that? And so I already thought I knew about Jesus, but I, I've always, and, and this kind of, you know, how God kind of wires you intuitively. Um, I don't, I've always, just my whole life, just respected boldness. And I just thought that was a bold move. I mean, I've been in football locker rooms. You, you talk about a lot of things there. That's not usually one of them. And, and for Jeff to not be afraid of how he was judged or be um, nervous about how he'd even respond. And on it, I've, I chuckle about it even now that he didn't really give me an option. He just said, we're doing it. When do you want to do it? Right. I need to tell you about Jesus. When do you want to do it? It wasn't, hey, man, can we talk? It was like, hey, I'm doing this. I'm going to let you decide when. Right. And so that. That was kind of a turn for me. And then he walked in a type of humility that I grew to respect in that I would press and I'd ask questions and I didn't want to believe. So when you don't want to believe, you're like the Pharisees in the Bible who always think of another question to ask. Right. And, and even when you get your question answered, it doesn't make you believe. It just makes you find another question to justify your unbelief. And even as I did that, Jeff was just patient. He would give me a book to read and he would say, most often he'd say, man, I have no idea, but I can ask. And, um, and, and, then, and then just the Lord was drawing my heart to him. Mm. I mean, he just was. I don't know how else to explain it. That, there's that, I think, there's that intellectual component that, that's an important piece. And, and, but I also think there's this thing that just God does, this kind of mysterious draw um, that, that he does to call people to himself. And, right. and so Jeff was trying to satisfy my intellectual questions and the Holy Spirit was drawing me in. And I didn't even know, I, I had no idea it was actually going on. Um, so, cause I would go to church with him and I would think it was real kitschy. And uh, I've said before, even publicly, that so much of it kind of reminded me of a Saturday Night Live sketch. And, uh, and yet I kept wanting to come back. And I didn't know at the time, oh, this is, there's this mysterious thing happening to me where the Lord's wooing me to himself. Uh, I just thought, yeah, I'll go back. I mean, I wouldn't, I couldn't put it together. I didn't know enough to think this might be growing on me. Uh, right. I better be careful here. I, I never thought that. I right. just thought, sure, I'll go with you. So that's, that's kind of how it happened. So um, I want to jump to something you said earlier. Someone you talk about a lot, obviously, is Lauren. Yeah. And you've, pu you've, you've said publicly, you know, on numerous occasions. Sure. The first seven years of your marriage were terrible. <laughs> terrible. terrible. And, and if she was here, she would, she would amen that. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't terrible. Don't, don't hear. It was terrible for me. She was lucky. She had, no, it was terrible for all of us, all involved. What, why? What, what was going on? Yeah, you know what? It's, and this might sound maybe even trivial or trite to whoever is listening or watching this. But um, so my background uh, as a guy growing up in a home where I, I can't earn the approval of my father, regardless of what kind of athlete I am, regardless of what kind of student I am. He just didn't know how to relate to me, not because of me, honestly, but because of his own issues. So I had like these deeply embedded insecurities. Mm. Um, and, and so I, I was almost looking for her to reject me. Um, and then she's coming from this background where it's church every weekend. You, know, you make you look pretty even if you're not pretty. Right. And I, I honestly didn't quite know how to do that. And, and so she was, if she was here, she, I'm, this is what she would say. She, she had a tendency to be um, um, careless and to be self-absorbed. And so if you put my sweet bride who was self-absorbed into a house with me who's insecure, that self-absorption and insecurity put in a house together is toxic. And that's what it was. It was always, it was, it was this kind of, it seemed like a, this cycle that just wouldn't stop where we'd do well for a couple of weeks and then we'd get right back into the same old argument. And, um, and so that was the first seven years. And there were literally nights where I laid in bed and I thought, surely this isn't the rest of my life. Because divorce was never on the, I mean, it was just never gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And so, so, I mean, I would think, and I, I mean, I would literally pray, okay, Lord, is this, is this how you're gonna say, is this how you're gonna knit me to yourself? Because everything else was going gangbusters. I mean, if I let it, it blew up. Mm -hmm. And and so kind of that thing that kind of hooked into me and pulled me into the Lord was two things. One, it was my marriage. It was difficult. And two, it was the fact that everything else was going so well and that made me nervous. 
What was the turning point? Well, uh, I think there, there were two things. Um, the, the first thing was uh, I wanted to not try to be the Holy Spirit for Lauren and I just wanted to work on my own heart. So like the lie I believed that made, you know, what probably could have been two years turn into seven years was instead of going, I need to help Lauren understand what she's doing wrong that makes me feel the way I feel. I was literally, that's how, what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. Let me help her understand how when she does this, it makes me feel like this. And when I feel like this, then I act like this, which leads to this. That was literally default position in my heart for six years. Then at, at six years, I went, no, what I need to do is I need to work on me. Mm -hmm. uh, I need to just, something's misfiring in me. There's some sort of disjoint in me. Like I don't, I don't know why that bothers me. It doesn't even make sense that it bothers me. And so, man, I went, it's funny, I mean, I'm, I'm a pastor and um, growing organizations that I'm leading and just went to a biblical counselor. I said, I need help. I don't know how to navigate this. I'm trying, but I don't know how. And, and really started to just let someone shepherd me in my own heart, let someone lead me to see things in a way that I wasn't able to see them at the time. Um, and, and really when I just started working on me, like it, now all of a sudden Lauren wasn't getting confused by my weirdness and she was able to see herself more clearly. And then Lauren began to take some steps um, to, to work on her own heart. And so it was amazing that when I quit trying to be the Holy Spirit for her, when I quit trying to say, this is what I need you to do in order for me to be happy, but, but really just said, I'm going to love and serve her regardless. I will not demand reciprocity. If I get reciprocity, then praise God, but I'm not going to demand it. I'm just going to love and serve her like Ephesians 5 tells me to. Um, and, and that'll be that. And I'm going to trust the Lord to be my strength. And I'm going to find my contentment, not in my wife. I'm going to find my contentment in the Lord. And, and by his grace and through some biblical guidance, uh, I started walking that path. And then Lauren started walking that path. And, and man, the, turn has been, uh, I mean, just best friend in the world. Can't wait to get home. Hate to leave in the morning. And, and even today I got, I got to the office today at six for uh, a meeting. Um, and man, just, I just took a, I mean, like a little 10 minute break, got in my car, ran home, gave her a kiss, got back in the car, came right back to the, I mean, just this is, we're in a beautiful season. How long, how long did that turn take? You know, when, when things are difficult, just those little increments feel like, I mean, they feel like a hundred miles, right. you know? And so I, you could feel year seven was a significant, significant year for us. And then it's just leaps and bounds uh, ever since. And, um, and I think both of us can default back into old modes, but we kind of know what's going on in our heart in that moment. Yeah. So I know if I have this thought, that, okay, that thought isn't consistent with reality and it's not consistent with the Word of God. That's my insecurities. That's my flesh. And I can line myself up with what the Word of God teaches and approach my wife with the gentleness and service that the Lord would call me to. How many years has it been now of marriage? Uh, we'll celebrate 15 next month. That's great. So, so yeah. you're, you're coming up, uh, you know, while we're, while we're filming this, you're going to be speaking, you know, to marriages this weekend. Yeah. Um, you know, my wife and I have walked alongside people who have struggled in marriage. Sure. We've, we've had our struggles. Why is it, do you think, that, that um, in Christian marriages, it's, it, it seems like, right, I, that there's just an epidemic, or, or maybe not epidemic, that's the wrong word, but just as prevalent in Christian yeah. marriages as there are in the world, you, you know, you know, separation, divorce, yeah. infidelity. Um, what what's going on there? Yeah, well, it. <laughs> I'm I'm tempted to quote Mark Twain on statistics because it's yeah. one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite quotes. But um, I think if you start to dig around in those statistics, you'll see that some aren't true. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is is if if you're saying that separation and divorce and marital difficulty. Um, exist in Christian marriages, I would certainly agree with you. Um, right. To say that it's almost as it, the same with the world, then, then I think statistically what you'll see is that people who are just self-identifiers as Christians, um, they, they're going to skew the they're going to skew the numbers because I know what some of the research I've seen shows that. Um, the more consistent uh, a couple is in worship together, the more consistent a couple is in the scriptures together, the more consistent uh, a couple serves in a local body together, the, 
the more likely their marriage is deep and healthy and um, fun. And, and, and so like the, the reason I read those statistics um, on Christian marriages always with a bit of a, uh, is because I had a guy even at this church three years ago tell me he was a Christian because he was born in San Antonio. Literally in, in his head, I was born in Texas. Of course, I'm a Christian. But of course, that you can't be born a Christian, right? You, right. you can't. Uh, and so, so I think, I don't think, but marriage is difficult because two sinners are living in a house together. And so for the unbeliever and the believer alike, there'll always be these moments of tension. Now, um, what the Word of God would tell the Christian is that there's a way to interact in that and navigate that that shows that there's a greater treasure for you and, and in a way that mirrors the gospel, mirrors Christ coming and dying for his bride and his church and, um, and, and his bride worshiping and serving and following him. And um, so that marriage then becomes a reflection of God's redeeming, saving grace and, and is for our sanctification, uh, n- not just our happiness, right? And um, so I think that's, that's where, where people are serious about their faith, their marriages tend to be much stronger than if it's just a signifier. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, so do you think there's, there's more of an answer and more hope in Christian marriage than there is outside? Well, I think there absolutely is because, and, and again, I, I know this will, if there's a comment section on this, this is going to blow it up. But biblically speaking, there's very little room for divorce. And so that, that means kind of the Hebrew word for love, ahava, love of the will, uh, I'm not going anywhere. And that's not a romantic kind of violin in the background, I'm not going anywhere. That's a, I've seen the worst in you and I'm staying. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that type of commitment, that type of love um, is a really safe place to struggle. Whereas kind of the, the garbage we see in movies that everybody's so drawn to that kind of romantic, love at first sight, emotive type of love, it, it's not safe, it's not good, and it doesn't lead anyone ultimately to joy. And so, so the example I've tried to use is at the height of my chemotherapy, I mean, my hair's gone, I've got sores in my mouth, I'm mustering the strength to pull myself up onto the toilet to vomit again. There's nothing sexy about me in that moment. There's nothing that would make my wife, my beautiful, physically beautiful, brilliant, intellectually godly wife to look at me and go, this is what I signed up for. No, I mean, the world would say, no, it's, you know, we should go out and play and have nice dinners and laugh and drink a good bottle of wine. And, then, and all those things are good. But, but in that moment, it's not an emotive love, but a covenantal love. That, that has her right by my side, crying with me, mourning with me, doing all she can to help me and serve me. When there is no reciprocity, and I mean, I'm not gonna go help her clean the kitchen after this. Um, and so that's a safe place, that kind of covenantal picture of love that's one soul saying to another soul, for better or for worse, rich or poor, all right, sickness or health, I'm doing it with you. And, and not, so I think what you see in the movies and what you hear in music is more contractual, right? It's let's make a contract. If you do this, I'll do this. If you do that, I'll do that. But think of how horrific a marriage ceremony would be if you sat in on a wedding and the vows were contractual and not covenantal. Um, so it's the, it's the biblical picture of one man giving his heart to one woman and one woman giving her heart, mind, body, soul to a man for life that's the kind of safe umbrella for human flourishing. And I think where that gets twisted, then human flourishing is affected. Mm. So let's, let's kind of bring this back out then, uh, you know, more 30,000 foot, because you're, you know, you're talk, you've talked about your marriage, you've talked about, you know, surviving the cancer. And, um, what is it when, if, if, if I were to ask, not even Lauren, but just someone who knows you well, if I say, you know, who is Matt Chandler, yeah. right? What do you, what do you want them to say? Yeah, um, you know what, I don't, I, what I try to, how I try to live my life is um, I, I want to, in every opportunity made available to me, make much of Christ and the gospel. And, um, and, and, and to shrink some personally so that that can be seen. And so what I learned early on as a communicator, as a preacher, 
is that you know if somebody thought my illustration was funny but they didn't hear what I said then I would feel like I just failed you know if they you know I would tell these goofy stories back when I was speaking to predominantly students and uh, you know like two years later like oh man the bear costume story I love that and I was like oh great well, do you remember what I was illustrating? Oh, no, no, no. But when you, man, when you scared those kids, it's so funny. And then I always feel like, well, golly, if, if I entertained you, but you didn't hear what I was saying about the Lord, then I, I don't know what we did. I don't know what we accomplished that night. And, um, and so I learned I, I need to stand on my personality a little bit. I need to be careful with kind of this gregarious kind of creature that can come out of me um, to, to make sure that when people leave this room and leave the other rooms of our campuses, that what they're thinking about is the grandeur and glory of God and not how funny Matt was or his personality. Or Now, I want to leverage who God's made me to make much of Jesus, of course, but um, it's a fine line. So my hope would be that people would say that man is passionately in love with Jesus Christ and he's bet his whole life on it. You, t you talked about making yourself smaller. I mean, how, how you lead a, a church of 11,000 members, right? That's, I mean, that's, that's members. Yeah. And, you know, uh, there's much more, many more than that that, that come on Sundays and, and whatnot. You know, the Acts 29 with 500 church, yeah. church planters. How, 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 how do you stay humble? Well, I think the way you do it, and, and I think this would probably be universally true, is I'm, I'm just going to make myself as available as possible. And so on a weekend service, I'm not hiding in some secret room where people can't approach me. I mean, I'm still walking out here in the foyer, meeting people, saying hello, trying to make myself as accessible to our members and to people as I possibly can while still maintaining some guardrails on my wife and family and my own physical health. And um, so, so I think, and then the other thing is like, all of this is so mysterious to me. Uh, like, I don't think it's a formula. I don't know how to, when people go, now, what do you guys do? Um, like think of, I mean, I, I preach for 50 minutes and we sing songs. We're not program based. We try to get people together, talking about the Bible, loving one another and serving the community. I mean, that's, that's, that's as old as the Christian faith. I mean, it's not, we're not innovative. We're not, I mean, we're not, like even if you look at kind of how we put together series, like when I preached through the book of Galatians, we just called it Galatians, right? There's not, not a lot of creativity, not a lot of innovation. It's just us faithfully preaching the gospel. Um, and so God's doing something that, that I'm, I try real hard not to touch. And so by making myself available, by understanding that God's doing something, I can motivate people. I know I can motivate them, but I can't motivate them outside the parking lot. Um, and, and so if I can motivate you, but that doesn't last, you know, 24 hours, then I don't want to motivate you. I want to see the Holy Spirit transform you. And so my, my understanding of how a human is transformed kind of informs uh, that kind of lowliness and, um, and then my desire to be everyday people. Mm -hmm. You've talked a, a little bit about those early years of, yeah. of when you were kind of learning to, to make all this, you know, all this work and, and happen. And, and I know, you know, you've been open, the website says, I mean, there's, there's a chunk of stuff that's not even on there, right? Sure, yeah. You know, I mean, is, is you know, is that, as you were learning and growing and figuring out who you who you were as a yeah, preacher, I think I lacked, I think I lacked some grace that I wish I would have had. Mm -hmm. I was 28 at the time, and and 28 year olds are 28 year olds, and so I, I lacked some grace. I lacked some understanding. So I said some things that that I wish I wouldn't have said, mm -hmm. and I uh, poked at things I wish I wouldn't have poked at. And so it was in. And then when you're 28 and you're preaching to a room of 500 people, you're not thinking, hey, one day people all over the world are going to listen to this. <laughs> and um, and and surely I should have known at least the Lord was listening to it. But, you know, I, I just had a bit more vinegar in me back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't very gracious and I wasn't gracious towards things I didn't even understand. And so as I grew older and as we kept getting emails about these things that I said, six years ago that, I mean, a couple times I was like, I didn't say that. <laughs> they were sending me a link to my own sermon. I was like, oh my gosh, I said that. I'm so sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. And so I finally went, okay, pull them. And so, and I'm sure post 2006, I've said some similar things, but right. um, I think I started to grow in grace and grow in understanding um, as a pastor and as a leader and then where I wasn't tearing down my brothers and I wasn't uh, attacking things that I didn't understand and, or straw men. I wasn't building straw men and, and burning them down, you know, so that people might uh, applaud our stance of truth or, you know, th those were the kind of things. And then 
And then I just had a bit of an edge to me that I didn't think was helpful. Yeah. I didn't think it was loving. And so uh, I want to stand for the truth always. Never want to be afraid to speak it. But I think there's a way to handle truth that's helpful. And then there's a way to handle it that's not helpful. So I'm sure, you know, obviously you, being in your position, you have your critics. You know, sure. people, people say things, that, you know. How, how, what's, what's, what's the way you found to respond to that, to, to them? Well, I mean, I want to, if I can, um, turn my critics into coaches. So if I can, so, um, so I mean, nobody can see this, but my, um, the, the guy that kind of helps me run my world's in the room with us. And uh, last week, a staff member who on our org chart is well below where I would be, sent me an email just asking a question about how I handle the text. And it seems like this is here, not this. And, um, and so I responded back, you know what, you're absolutely right. I, I don't know why I didn't see that in my own study. I see it now. Thanks for bringing that to my attention. And, and so I, I want to, as best I can, where it's legitimate, mm -hmm. Uh, I want to turn critics into coaches, and uh, where it's not, I just want to ignore. Uh, and, and so it's funny that this question kind of follows the 28, what happened to the sermons before 06, because I think uh, at times a lot of the critics are like I was when I was 28. They just don't quite understand. So like some of the things I would dog out when I was 28 um, were kind of how certain mega churches would would act and respond to things, and and then like, what could I possibly know about a church whose staff is larger than my whole congregation, right? So I'm taking shots. I don't even know what I'm talking about. And so a lot of times I think some of these critics are guys like I was when I'm 28. So people were gracious with me back then. And so I try to be gracious. And so where I can go, you're right. I think that's wise. Thank you that I do that. And where it's illegitimate, then it's illegitimate. Do you find it ironic? I mean, ironic now that you're leading a church of, of you know. Oh, don't so. think that I don't think it's crazy ironic. And because, you know, I left a very large stage preaching to thousands of people every week to come to this church, which at the time was 160 people. I had this kind of Mayberry romantic, 160 people digging deep, doing life richly. And then, you know, by the end of the first year, we're over a thousand and it was just, that, that was gone. Right. I was like, who are these people? Who, all right, let's, how do we disciple people? Yeah. Who, so, it, yeah, it's quite ironic. A Lord's sense of humor, I guess. Right, right. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to go to, to a little bit more of a specific topic, and okay. and it's 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 one thing that I heard you, you you preach on. I think maybe about a year and a half ago. Sure. Um, that I had never heard anyone have the guts to say sure. uh, from the pulpit, um, or or really cover in this way. And I think it was around the time of uh, there was something that was happening with. Uh, either Roe versus Wade or something like that. And you and you you kind of put it like this that if you're if you're going to be a one issue voter, yeah. then and and if you believe that life starts in the womb, yeah. there's th that's the issue to be a, yeah. a one issue voter on, right? If there's this mass genocide going on. Yeah. Maybe you can kind of unpack that and explain that a little bit. Well, I think I have I don't think I have deep 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 convictions intellectually and spiritually and biblically with abortion. And, and I think when we talk about abortion, we never need to talk about abortion in a way that we wouldn't talk about abortion if we were sitting across the table from someone who had one or who had paid for one or forced one on uh, a girlfriend or wife or, or whatever. So I, I want to, with compassionate conviction, address this subject. And, and so I do it every year. So uh, at least once a year. Um, and then on, on big years where it, voting, I almost always wanna talk about how, how the Christian should approach um, politics. And so um, in, in this issue in particular, I, I think I wanna be real straight about the fact that you can be pro-life and be completely incompetent as a politician. I mean, you can literally just be pro-life and have no business being in public office, N no business being in any kind of leadership role, or but but at the same time, um, at, at the same time we must not if we believe what the Bible says about when life begins and what life is, and the and and listen even let's let's do this because I don't know who all even if we just want to look at this scientifically, um, let, let, we can even walk away from the Bible if we can just look at it scientifically and science now. I mean, you, you have the arguments around abortion are starting to change. Uh, even in, in the sermon I preached last year showed this in kind of secular 
articles and medias where science has now proven, hey, this has a heartbeat, this has brain waves, this kidneys are functioning, breathing, this little baby is. And so now it's whose life is more important kind of argumentation, which historically speaking is crazy. Um, and, and so if we believe that believer, unbeliever, Christian, not Christian, if we believe that life begins at conception in the womb and science backs us up, and I believe it does, then to vote for someone who actively advocates for the murder of human beings is unconscionable. I mean, I just think it's madness. And so now the tricky part, the more, the bigger ethical dilemma is what happens when both candidates support choice over. Um, and so in that, in that moment, I, I, I don't think the Christian, the believer should ever retreat from the polls. Um, I, I think you've got to find the one who has a better position on the issue. And so um, if you don't have one that wants it all gone, but you have one that wants it to be more difficult to get, then, then I think we back that guy in, in viewing the whole of his political abilities or her political abilities, either way. I think one of the things that, that really did stand out to me in that sermon is you've been pretty open. You're, I mean, you're not, you, you don't talk politics from the pulpit. Rarely. And in, you know, I think that would, that, that would surprise a lot of people given where you are. You're in, the, you're in Dallas, yeah. you're Texas, you know, everyone here has, you know, you know, you know a card carrying Republican with a gun, right? Sure. And how do you, uh, first of all, why have you guarded against that and how do you guard against that? Yeah, well, first and foremost, what I want to do is, I don't, I don't think either party, just to be fair, and we'll just let, you know, let the comment sections continue. Um, I, I don't think either, either party has kind of dialed in on God's view of human flourishing. Uh, and so I feel like if I'm, if I'm going to take a party line in regards to politics, uh, I'm going to not be able to appeal to the sensibilities of the other party members. And, and, just, and we're seeing this right now. We're seeing they just can't work together, can't even think. You almost stand against it because the other is for it. And, and I think when you're talking about what the Word of God has to say, there's no space for that. Uh, and so I, I won't back a party, but I, what I will do is show you from the Word of God what's right, good, and true according to the Creator of all things. And so like if you, if you take when, when I tackle um, life every year, so anytime I tackle life, like everybody kind of goes, oh gosh, everybody brace for the emails, brace for the, you know, brace for somebody to get frustrated, brace for, and it's never happened. Like if anything, across the aisles, I mean, I've just got affirmation. I've got a brother that was bold and helpful, even from, you know, our, here in Dallas, our small little group of Democrats. Um, uh, one guy in particular that, gosh, he gets so razzed here, but uh, I mean, you know, like put stuff in his yard and I'm like, brother, you're going to get vandalized. But <laughs> But even, even in my conversations with this man, his name's John. I mean, John was like, that's, that's one of the best messages I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. and, and so now if I would have made that a political issue, then, I mean, I guarantee he'd have felt isolated. He'd have felt, um, and so I, I'm just not gonna get in that world. What I'm gonna do is preach from the word of God, God's command on us to be generous towards the poor and the needy. I'm going to um, preach that the, the gospel would drive us to care for the um, widow and orphan in their distress. And I'm going to preach life and, um, and on and on and on. And so uh, ultimately, I found that by being a Bible man rather than a party man, that I, I can preach truth into both parties. Right. And so the second I think I would self-identify, then, then I've just demo that bridge. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I want to say, be involved in the political pop, you know, process. Right. Don't, you have a Christian responsibility to be a good citizen. Mm -hmm. So you need to know what the issues are. You need to, like, I'm hopeful, very hopeful that at the time of this, our church is aware of how huge of a week this is with the Supreme Court, you know, got, have just a bit of a session left, you know, by the end of the week. And we'll have massive decisions rolling out this week on the on uh, Hobby Lobby and their, you know, argument of conscience against having to pay for um, abortive medicines for their employees. Um, that's going to be a huge. So I'm hopeful that the people of the village church know that, are prayerful about that, and, and just are dialed into what's going on in, in regards to um, politics in this country. That's actually a good, a, a, a good little segue because 
one of the other things that you did talk about from the pulpit was the Chick-fil-A yeah. uh, thing with, 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 you know, Kathy saying what he, what he did and, and, and coming under fire. You've also said that you continue the, the outlook for Christianity, Christian views, um, and the church doesn't seem to be, we seem to be going towards more persecution. Sure. Right? Well, I would call it more marginalization than persecution, but yeah. And it, I think it might ultimately be a, a good spot for us for a, a bit. And I, I think my fear is, and specifically with, as we're looking at uh, what's going on with Hobby Lobby, is th there is, the Constitution guarantees us a, a right to practice our religion, not to believe our religion, but to practice it. And so if um, this continued legislation occurs that, that tries to keep us from practicing our religion um, uh, occurs, then, then, then you'll see us squeezed into the margins in a way that we're just unfamiliar and operating in. Um, and, and honestly, I think we've handled things poorly over the years that have led to some of this marginalization. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll learn to flourish in the margins Christianity historically has. Uh, I mean, if you look at where we are now as opposed to, say, the way things were in the first century or when Christianity was really exploding, it was totally marginalized and misunderstood, uh, attacked, persecuted violently. Um, I think my concern right now has much more to do with just religious liberty um, and, and the fact that y you, can, y you can just participate in your faith and, and answer a question. You're not picketing anything. You're not trying to oppress anyone. You're not, you literally are ask a question and, and you answer the question you were asked and then immediately get lumped in with the KKK uh, or Al Qaeda or, I mean, it really is, it, people have lost their minds in a lot of these ways. Um, and so I, I, I see it coming. I'm just trying to help our church be prepared to understand the times in which they live, which is Paul's command to the church at Thessalonica and um, to, to navigate it well. So even though you see more marginal, marginalization coming, you don't necessarily foresee a, necessarily a dark time? Well, I think... For, so, for the church... Yeah, you know. I've tried to say this um, over the years. I, I don't think there ever was a good old day. Hmm. And, and so I don't... This will definitely be a new season for um, Bible-believing Christians in the United States. You can already see... Um, you can see those who are progressives, which I've just always laughed at that term. It's just a funny term. The, you know, as if, you know, as if we've got a ton of evidence that we're making progress. Um, so, at, you know, it's, it's funny. If you go back and look at some of the things that were said about being on the right side of history in Russia around Stalin and, you know, I mean, everybody makes that argument the right side of history and you're just like, well, you might want to wait on that. Uh, you know, can we can we really judge right side of history right now? We don't we need to give it a century or so, right. 50 years or so. And so ultimately the um, this kind of idea that that there's this progress, I, I think it's it's the wrong idea. And so I I've just tried to teach the men and women at the village. Let's be faithful in our presence. Um, so let's work hard in our jobs. Um, let's serve the community well. Um, let's be known as people who are genuinely loving and care um, and do life deeply with one another. And so um, the Christian practice of hospitality becomes imperative in an environment where there is growing hostility. And so, um, so the men and women who come to my house, um, they're, they're not all pretty well put together people. And so um, whether, you know, we've got a dear friend of ours, um, long time practicing homosexual, um, who taught my daughter to ride horses and has been to our house for dinner and has come over on holidays and who has. And so if someone were to find out I was a Bible believing Christian and go listen to my hour and a half long message on homosexuality and call me a bigot, she would just laugh. I mean, she would she'd laugh till she peed her pants. I mean, she, the idea that I'm hateful or bigoted towards her would, I mean, she wouldn't have a category for that. Um, and she, she's not a project. She's a dear friend. In fact, I just had my 40th birthday party, just my closest friends and family were there. And she was there. I mean, it's not, I mean, she would just laugh that if anyone said, oh, he's just trying to, you know, you're a project to him. I mean, she would just laugh at all of that. And so by loving people, walking with them, encouraging them and not agreeing with them, 
that that practice of hospitality can kind of transcend the accusations made against many Bible believing Christians. It's when you're afraid of them and you're afraid that you might catch the sins or you buy into fear mongering that I think you, you lose your testimony of the goodness and grace of God. So to understand that we live in a world that thinks that disagreement means I hate you or disagreement means um, something along those lines. I'm afraid of you or I hate you is how what I've picked up on is if I disagree with someone on the issues of homosexuality, on the issues of gay marriage, on the issue of abortion, on the issue, the argument almost always turns um, angry and aggressive quickly that I either hate somebody uh, or that I'm afraid of someone and neither are true, I just disagree. And I think, I mean, my history might be a little fuzzy here, but I, but I think the country's kind of been built around this idea that we have the right to disagree with one another and still respect one another and do life in the same place. Mm -hmm. um, and so my hope is that on both sides of things, um, we can learn to disagree and please compel me to try to change my mind. I'm planning on compelling you to change yours. Right. And that's what's made, I think that's what's made America so awesome is that there's been this freedom of ideas that let, let's talk to, let me try to compel you, you try to compel me. I think we have the better story. Right. I, th I think we've got the better story. Grace, forgiveness, healing, wholeness, human flourishing. That's our story, that's our message. Do you think, you, you know, you, you kind of brought up, you know, that, that disagreement. I think we've seen, we've seen movements just within the church, right? Sure. You know, the, 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 there was an emergent movement for a while yeah. um, that was really popular. There was, you know, the PCUSA just recently. Oh, that was a train wreck, wasn't it? <laughs> well, <laughs> just trying to light up those comments. Hey, it's been a while since yeah. a hateful comment, and so I thought I'd light that up. <laughs> Ding! <laughs> um, do, do you think there, do you think there's a, a, a um, I'll just, for lack of a better term, a crisis of, 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 theology within movements of, of the church? Or do you think there's just... I, I think in every generation, there's, there are people that, because they want to see people become Christians, change the fundamental message of Christianity to where the costly aspects of it aren't there. So no one's following Christ that has not laid things down at the altar and died to himself in some ways. Um, and so I, I, remember, I remember this interview with uh, Rick Warren and, and Ann Curry and um, in it, uh, and I believe asked him the question, if they, if they um, showed you without a doubt that homosexuality, you were born with it, you were, then um, would you change your stance on it? He was like, well, absolutely not. And you could see like, she got really frustrated uh, at his answer. And then he said, well, I can tell you this about me. I have a desire to have sex with every beautiful woman I see, and no one's arguing that that's right or good, and no one's arguing that that's what would be best for culture and society at large. And, and so ultimately, I, I think that's the, I think that's the, there, there's always a group in every generation that in their desire to see somebody come to become a Christian um, will fundamentally change the need to repent and, and say there's really nothing to repent from, for. You, you, you know, you're awesome. You should just be on God's team because you're awesome and God wants you to be awesome on his team. He wants you to rep him well, uh, all under all under the umbrella of progress and you know it, it works that way it, so the generation before us it was mainline protestantism mm -hmm. and and so and, and you can see where that that got some of those denominations and so even you brought up the pc usa i mean they're bleeding out like crazy um so i mean their their numbers are dwindling super high. It doesn't to fundamentally change the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to lose it altogether. You try to give Jesus a makeover, then you lose him. He's the king of glory. You don't give the king of glory a makeover. He transcends times and cultures. Um, and so to pretend that right now, culture in the West is the apex of human existence is unbelievably arrogant. I mean, it's unbelievably arrogant. It's like we look back at our grandparents and great grandparents in the civil rights era, and you're just like, you morons. But we're, we're, we feel as though there's nothing like that right now with us. Like we're just so far ahead of them. And I guarantee, I mean, 50 years from now, our kids are gonna look at us and just go morons. <laughs> and where were you, you know? And, and we'll have things that we're ashamed of and embarrassed right. of, just like our grandparents do. Right. Um, but we don't think that right now. We think we're, you know, yeah. so we're blind to it. Right. Right. And so I, I think the laying down of, 
aspects of our desires are a good thing and the church should expect to do that and 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 where cultural accommodation becomes the let's let's win them to Jesus without having them repent of sin is an impossibility and so what you do is you get some sort of social club that has no right to call itself a church um, so so let, 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 let's switch gears a little bit um, you know, we talked you know Matt Chandler you know you're, you're leading a church you're leading a ministry what do what do you do to just relax what do you do what do you do to chill yeah um, <laughs> You know, it's funny you ask. I really don't have any real hobbies. I like to, um, I like to CrossFit and I like to read. So those are kind of the two things I do. I can't, I can't think of anything else. So. You just, you just be, the fact that you just said the magic word, CrossFit. Are you? A, are you? A my, my my boss is a huge. Okay. Like he he came to Dallas, took the test to become an instructor at his box. Okay. Like. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I like. It. There's a competitive thing to it that I that I like and I kind of miss just kind of playing sports and stuff growing up and then that kind of all that disappears when you're in your 30s and 40s so to be able to go and go for time and go for reps and so maybe that is revealing about my personality have to do burpees if you're 10 minutes late you know those kind of things yeah sure I like I like that kind of structure yeah (laughs) so yeah I don't but I I also I I don't know that I've ever need needed that kind of escape Uh, and I just love what I get to do and find a lot of joy in it. And I mean, I certainly get stressed at times and have deadlines that um, wig me out. In fact, this week, I've got several of them. And so, but at the same time, um, that I get to play in these spaces. So, so many, so many aspects of the day are, are sacred and beautiful. Like right before I came in here, we were um, praying for um, a, a woman with a heart defect that, I mean, they've given her about 50-50 to live. And so just praying for her and then meeting uh, just talking about how we want to address some of the um, ridiculous levels of poverty that are just two exits down from us um, and how as a church of our size and with our wealth that, that we might really engage in a deep and meaningful way among the poorest of the poor around here. Like that's a great day, man. I mean, that's hard and long, but it's, it's a beautiful, sacred calling and, and I love it. How do you how do you prepare for your sermons, right? I mean, are you someone that has you know, hey, th- three months out, we know where we're going, or, <laughs> or we have an know. idea where we're going three months out? Sure. Um, you know, I I feel like I'm always preparing, and uh, that's probably I'm not trying to dodge your question. I mean, I'm just an avid reader, mm-hmm. um, and and whether that be blogs or podcasts or books or um, newspapers. I mean, I've got um, New York Times and Wall Street Journal um, on my iPad every morning and. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to devour all I can and consider and think through, um, a, you know, a biblical worldview and um, and and so I'm kind of always and then I'm an Evernote just junkie. I'm gonna just drop everything in Amen. Evernote Amen. so that I can go when it comes time to preach and you know I've thrown all these articles and things into Evernote that then I'm, I'm pulling back up and going okay I remember this article I read in the Times by David Brooks who mm-hmm. um, who. And so Brooks is a guy I love. I've just been praying for years that he would become a Christian and follow the Lord. And um, some of my friends have actually even mocked me about that. But he's just such Same a good what? writer. You... So, well, I mean, they just think it's goofy that here's this op-ed writer for the New York Times. And I'm like, Lord, will you please open his heart and mind to believe and trust in you? He's just such a <laughs> great thinker and such a, um, so mad respect for him. But um, so I can remember those things and, you know, pull. And so even, I mean, I'm, I'm using Brooks because he wrote, he wrote an article, gosh, it's probably a year too old, called The Arena Culture. And I actually pulled it up this week for as I just was looking at my sermon this weekend. Uh, just going, now what did Brooks say here again about that? Because he, he's tapping into something that's true and biblical. And, and I'm not quite sure he knows that it's biblical, right. but, but he is because the Lord's put the law in his heart, whether he knows it or not. And, uh, and so, yeah, so I'm always processing. I've got pretty much lockdown day. So Thursday's a huge kind of study day for me. And, and so that's just kind of a lockdown study day. Once a month, I have a full on day that's just me and the Lord and prayerful kind of consideration of what's to come and how I should lead and things I need to cover. And then uh, I have a retreat with our executive team here at the church in July, in which we'll look at 2015. Uh, and look at kind of the things I would like to cover in 15 so that we can start building some things around it. Uh, I want to, and this might get me in trouble because we're Baptist, but I want to preach through the Apostles' Creed. 
So I just think that would be to kind of, again, that kind of anchor of kind of, this is how Christians historically, have known, this is what we believe. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, Baptists have a tendency to go, no creed, but the Bible. Um, I, I've heard that, but it's, you know, if the creed is from the scriptures, right? right. Um, we don't say no sermon, but the Bible, right? I mean, that's <laughs> not, so I uh, want to do that. And so I'm already thinking 15 and, um, and the fall of 14 is roughly built and turned in to our communication department to build out Bible studies around it, home group curriculum and all of that. Is there, is, is there one thing you found that's just, you, you know, as you've, as you've gone through, you know, your, 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 you know, 14 years into your marriage, um, or 15, I should say, sorry. Um, you know, how many years, you know, that you're at the village church, is there one thing that, and besides the cancer, cause we know that, and maybe that is the sure. answer, I guess, that's the hardest. What's been the hardest thing is you've, if you've, uh, you've led your wife, you've led yeah. your family, you've led people. Well, I think, I think the thing that I had to learn early on that's benefited the most and has been difficult is um, the raising up of um, other men and women around me and giving away big chunks of authority and giving away big chunks of um, things that need to get done. So early on here, I just shaped everything. I had my hand and everything. I mean, there was staff was so tiny that I, that I kind of was doing everything. And then as guys started to, men and women began to be raised up here that, that had, I mean, strong giftings and um, an unbelievable bandwidth, kind of taking major aspects of my world and just handing it to someone going, okay, I've just prayed and cried and built this for years. Please don't, please don't drop it and let them run and trust them to run with it and not need to micromanage and get in there. And uh, that's, that's paid a lot of dividends. It's also been, you know, I remember the, the first kind of time I did that, I would walk by and there'd be these meetings with a lot of other, well, we'll just call executives. It'd be helpful probably to call them executives. I'd look in there, I'd, I would, I'd be like, the entire exec team is in there, but me <laughs> thinking, gosh, am I, be, am I being voted out today? Am I, do I need to get my resume together? Is this, you know? And so that, that's been one of the more difficult and yet one of the more necessary parts. Mm. And so I think that's been kind of the handing big chunks over for other guys to run. Anything that we'd be surprised to know about you? Man, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. I'm pretty transparent. So right, if you, right. uh, yeah, I'm, right. I'm just kind of wear it all on the sleeve. So. All right. All right. I think we got it. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very Thanks, much. Yeah. Bless you, brother.